So welcome to the first of the uh, concurrent presentations. Um, this, I suppose, is day three, though, of the conference. Was there anyone who attended any of the first two days uh, training seminars? So, yeah, just they are included in the price of the conference, guys. So we strongly encourage your attendance. So you're all more than welcome for next year. So first presenter, I'll kick off straight away, is William Bill Britton giving a presentation on the California Cybersecurity Institute. Um, just a reminder, you can do questions through the... Uh, mobile app too, which will then do questions at the end, but take it thank away. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is great because that means you have something to do with security in some way, shape, or fashion, or education, which means we're already a limited segment of the group that we have, which is a very scary thought. First of all, what a shirt. I mean, <laughs> man, I'm going to have to take my glasses off to get through the rest of this presentation. Uh, let me get started by first saying thank you to uh, Queensland University, uh, to uh, Ostert for inviting uh, a Californian out here. And of course, you're all wondering, why in the world would they invite somebody from California to come speak in Australia? I think what we've done is something really different, unique, and a twist that I hope you can either get some lessons learned from, some experience from, or even look at things a little differently. But what is the number one problem you have in all your jobs, besides the fact that somebody's trying to attack you on a daily basis? What is really the bottom line, biggest problem you have? Users, workforce, skills. Isn't it all tied about training and education? And so how much of our time do we spend buying, writing lots of big checks, vice training people to not make those dumb mistakes? Or even better, how do you develop the workforce for the future? We have AI. How many times have you heard that term? Machine learning, right? We'll all be out of a job in a year and a half, right? Well, no, not really. Because, again, in the AI and machine learning, somebody has to program it, somebody has to develop it, somebody has to watch it, somebody has to monitor it. There's all these things. And so in this realm, um, I work at Cal Poly University. It's a polytechnic in the States, and it's in San Luis Obispo. So if you know where LA is, raise your hands. You know where San Francisco is. Fold those two in half, right where you put the staple is where we are at. So we're right in the middle of those two entities, and we use that as a, a real distinct advantage to us. It just happens to be the, the happiest place in the world because it is also the new emerging wine country. So not a bad deal that you get to teach at a university, run the IT, and drink a lot of wine. Somebody had to do it. I, I volunteered. So, so here's what we've done. That's so maybe it isn't. I saw you do this earlier, David, so I'll see if I have the secret. So here's the secret to all of this. Somebody said one day in the middle of a semi-joke, they said, you know, this is all about training and education. And I jokingly replied back to the individual, well, if I had a facility, I could probably fix all this for the state of California. So, so why is California such a unique aspect? Well, realize California is the fifth largest economy in the world has the most number of internet developing companies and existing companies in the United States. It has the most number of cyber companies in the United States. It has the most number of startups. Over 550 startups a year in cyber. The next closest state in the United States is Massachusetts and Virginia at 55. That's a big number. Now, in all of that grandiose data and factoids, how many different training operations that go statewide? Zero. So even though we have all of these resources, we don't have resources that look at the state problem on a larger scale, such as in law enforcement and other areas. So we made a joke with the National Guard that if I had a building, they said uh, I could fix this problem. And they said, well, we have a building. Actually, we have three buildings. How many would you like? I said three. They gave us all three for the Institute. So basically what we've created in this picture here is an academic range here in the center that looks like a U building. Above that to the north of the picture is an actual uh, regional cyber forensics lab and I'm going to talk about all of these things. And the third item is this very large white building is a former warehouse that's been turned into a cyber range. So you've run multiple cyber activities, ranges, range setups, uh, in, in immersion learning based uh, laboratory environments that we've run in that. So this is really the end state of, of what we're going to talk about as we go here. This is operational. This is being utilized today. 
We're doing some amazing things, and hopefully in this uh, quick uh, session we have together, we'll walk through them. Now, I have three rules of engagement for the session today. The first rule of engagement is there are no rules. Ask questions at any time. Don't, don't make it where I'm just talking the whole time or I fail. The second rule is you have to be interactive, so you have to ask questions. And the third one is I promise not to sell you anything. Uh, th those of you that understand where I'm coming from, I was a vendor, so I get it. I, I hate it as much as, as you all do, so we'll just go from there and see what happens. So this is the facility as it is today. We reference it, the perfect storm of infrastructure. Realize for those buildings, for the university, I pay $0 in rent for brick and mortar. Why? Because I'm doing in-kind support, which means whatever modifications I make to the building, whatever training I do for the National Guard, that is payment for those facilities. So imagine having over t almost 200,000 square feet free of charge for use for cyber activities and training. Now, the cool thing is it's less than a mile and a half from the university itself. So we have the advantage of taking the students and having them go out to the installation. It has armed guards because it's a military installation, but it's a state. The National Guard is not a federal entity. It's a state entity. As a state institution, we get to work with them on a state level. It takes a memorandum of agreement to do business, not a contract, not, not an RFP, none of those things. So it, it's really, again, the perfect storm of infrastructure. I went the wrong way, didn't I? Oh, boy. Okay, we can do this. So let's talk about a little bit about how we got here. Uh, and I think this is an important conversation because as we said, training, education, understanding. So when you get a new person on board in your company, you've just gotten them out of university. Anybody in the university, plug your ears. Yeah, uh, okay, hold that thought. What do you have to do the first six weeks, six months with that new person? Anybody? Train them. What else? What other words come to mind? Teach them what work hours are. Right? Right? Culture. Right. What else? Work with others. Absolutely. And work with customers who have a unique perspective that they're wrong at times and how used to they are they to being wrong in a school environment. You had a question? Nope. Okay. You're waving off. Got it. We'll come back to you, though. Don't, you're not getting off the hook. All right. So, again, let's think about that. So, we basically are saying here we have to kind of retrain them. But what is it the training really does? It talks about the practical application of what you're doing in your workplace, right? Now, if they go into the federal government, if they go into the government, they go into law enforcement, any of those things, how long does it take to bring someone up to speed? Any? How much? Months? Okay, I've got three months. Six months. Six months? A dollar. Come on, throw it out here. A year, yes. We're getting closer to the real numbers because you, you go ahead. Minimum two years. Why? 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 What is going on that it takes that long? In the back. I can see you're ready to say it. What takes so long? Sorry? Understanding the work ethic, understanding the place, and then how many things are unique in that job placement? Particularly if you're working with, say, law enforcement, forensics, computer forensics, uh, learning diagnostics, all of those things. And if you're in a workplace, do you really want to take someone who's fresh out of university and make them your CISO for a billion dollar corporation? No, no. So in the States, we have an estimated shortage for workforce and cybersecurity somewhere between 250 and 750,000 positions. I don't know how many times I've tried to talk to people and say, what does that mean? They say, you have to produce more students is what it means. I go, okay, what do you want me to teach them? Right? And so they, they all have their own personal opinion. But you know the number one uh, trait they want? Job experience. <laughs> Job experience. Uh, unless I am creating a ton of interns, which, oh, wait a minute, what I need to create interns is what? An institute where they have the opportunity to work with law enforcement and other agencies and get it. So here's how this journey really started. We, we had a desire to develop something at Cal Poly, and, and they were trying to do it from the academic perspective solely, okay? 
which is interesting about that is they kept going to their corporate partners and they would say, listen, we, we need some additional funds. I'm sure those of you in the academic world understand about asking for funds to, to be able to survive. They asked for funds and one of the companies they went to was a company by the name of Parsons out of California. And, and Parsons' CEO is a Cal Poly graduate and he's on the president's board of advisors. So he's used to writing checks to the university. And, and he said, what do you need this time? Well, that's not a good start when you're asking for money because it usually leads to a very bad subject. He, they said, we want somebody to be our cybersecurity director. So in that capacity, we need somebody from the field. And to do that, we're going to have to pay over $250,000, $300,000. And he had a very interesting response. I'll do better than that. I'll give you a bill. So two days later, he told me I'd been volunteered to go to California. I had to actually look up where this place is at because I had no clue of what it was. But the idea was... Cybersecurity requires a unique perspective to be successful, and that's understanding that workplace environment. So they took somebody out of the field of cybersecurity and put them into the academic environment to organize and construct what they were going to do and try to go forward. So there's desire, uh, strategic direction. Um, if the president of the university, if somebody in responsible area, not just the president of the university, but those who are outside, academics in the world at large and corporations. If they really don't say we need to make a change on how we do this, nothing happens. So um, again, there was a direction. Student desire for knowledge. Um, anybody that works in a university will tell you that these students come in and they already understand more about computers than we ever imagined. They live it. They have lived it since they were children. I mean, babies in the, in the crate and they're, you know, they're playing with computers already. How many of us have seen adults give a three, six-year-old a computer device and say, here, play with this? Right? It's happening all over the place. So their knowledge, their awareness. So that drove a, a, a unique response from us because how do you keep them informed in the other areas in, in the world at large? And how is this product, this capability, what you're studying, how is it used out there in the world? So again, the disconnect is the academics focus on the academic structure. And they're really, really good at that. But what did you say was the number one thing you wanted out of that student when they got there? Work experience. So how do you do that? There, there, there is a trick to that subject. And so that's what we want to come back to on that. Law enforcement needed assistance. So in our region, uh, San Luis Obispo, we have 12 different law enforcement agencies that, that are responsible for our area. Of those 12 when we started this journey, which was two and a half years ago, there were eight cyber forensics examiners. So are there any forensics examiners in the audience? Okay, none that are willing to attest to it. I got it. Those forensics examiners are the ones who do cell phones and computers, and 90% of their time is unfortunately based on child pornography, pornography events, and things that drive them out the door. So in the first year of working with that group, Six of them separated from their job. They didn't even make retirement. They just left. So of those six, there's now um, four, two, two left. One is part-time, one is full-time. And they're supposed to solve all the crimes for our region. Now, what's really sad about that is, is that number is very parallel. And a lot of those that go into the business in law enforcement, forensics examiners are self-taught. They haven't really been through a formal training. As a matter of fact, one of our examiners is a Cal Poly grad in Parks and Rec. The other examiner we had was a retired family physician. He was pretty good with computers. So he taught himself to do that. So, so what we're seeing is, is how do we help that law enforcement community? So what we did is we, we had a sit-down session with our uh, university white hat club. Is everybody familiar with the white hat clubs? Right, so th those are the student good guy hackers, as so to speak, and they're taught ethical hacking and the, you know certified ethical hackers and that sort of thing. So we had to sit down with them, and we had about sixty of them in the room. And I asked the the whole group. I said, "How many of you have any interaction with law enforcement, defense, Department of Defense, intelligence community, any of those entities that have a social responsible side for cybersecurity?" And then one student raised his hand. And he said, yeah, man, I had a guy that was arrested, a friend of mine, by DIA for hacking. There's two things wrong with this problem, what I just said. The DIA, Defense Intelligence AG, can't arrest anybody. They don't have jurisdiction. 
Number two, they do on TV. So his entire exposure was what he was seeing in TV and on the movie theater. So the question is, is what are we doing to change that so that they have a desire to have an application in that world and do something in the good side of cyber? So we looked at that. We brought those students together with the law enforcement community and had them sit down for lunch because what's the old expression? If you have lunch, you'll have the cops at the table. So we had them and the students also. They love to eat as well, free. So we had them in the room. The meeting went an extra 45 minutes long. It was not the examiner talking to the students. It was the students talking to the examiner. And what they said was they were describing ways to hide things in a computer. And they were talking about file directory management, where they would hide some things, where they put stuff on their own. Afterwards, the examiner came up to me and says, that's the best 45 minutes I've ever had. I learned more in that 45 minutes because I got into their head and listened about how they think and hide these things. How do we do more of that? How do we do more of that? That more of that was the emphasis that really drove us to the next thing, which was if law enforcement has a need, does the California military, also the National Guard as they're called, do they have a need? And the answer is yes. And as we were beginning this conversation, the Department of Defense in the states generated what they called Cyber Strategy 2015, which said certain states were going to stand up cyber protection teams. But they didn't say how. They didn't give them money. They just said, go forth and do really good stuff. The problem is in cyber, do you want people to go forth and do really good stuff without rules and process and procedures and without training? The answer is really, I hope to God not. So, so that's what we did. And that's how we got into this joke, if you would, about the fact that if I had a building, I could solve this problem. Going the wrong way again. So this is what we came up with. There's a lot of words. Basic bottom line, what it says is the university will provide uh, an educational opportunity for law enforcement communities, state agencies, and students themselves. In this, what we've created is something really unique. We have a stakeholder group that consists of the Attorney General of the State of California, the CHP. If you, I'm sure you all saw the movie, right? right? They don't just ride bikes anymore. Five, six years ago now, the CHP was made the state responder for the state of California for cyber forensics issues. So they have the jurisdiction for a state issue. Well, ask me how many forensics examiners CHP has for the entire state of California, because I can do it on one hand. Five. All right. So this is yet again, another problem where they have to compete with commercial market. And the commercial market pays a whole lot better than the $48,000 a year the entry fee is, the entry salary is for a CHP officer. So th there are some challenges with that. And so what we wanted to do was say, you know, all of these things evolve around training and education. We as a university do education and training. If there is a need, why don't we cooperate as a collective and create this? So the CHP is part of it. The other part of it is the Department of Technology, which in California is where you find the state CIO and the state CISO. We also then have the Office of Emergency Services, which is in California very interesting. So we have a lot of fires, we have a lot of earthquakes, we have a lot of floods. Um, those are all under emergency services and cyber, cyber response. So of those four, which one do you think gets most of the attention? Earthquakes. It's a trick question because it's always the one who's really happening at the time. So fires takes an awful lot of time, right? Uh, but then when there's an earthquake, there's an awful lot of earthquakes. So, so again, where does cyber fall in that? Well, I said there were four. It falls in about seventh because all of those other ones are reoccurring and they always go in front of that cyber component. So, so that now what we're trying to do is to incorporate how we do business in a university and how we do business. It's called learn by doing. And learn by doing is really immersion learning. So you, if you're in computer science, you have to have a lab with every class you take. All right. And so, again, we do that in all the differing schools across the university. So what we've done as part of our design for building the Cybersecurity Institute is to include immersion learning. There is a touch to every facet of what we're doing. So, again, we think that that really adds a, an elongated value because, again, uh, all of you who are out there know if you're not getting training, it's not working. Uh, you, you, you've got to have continuum. It, it, you have to have your hands on these things. And how much does this stuff change? A little? A lot? 
right? So imagine yourself as a forensics examiner for law enforcement. You're now responsible for 172,000 different cell phones, and you have to figure out how to extract information off of every one of them because every case has a connection to it. And we found even a more interesting data point that was brought to our attention by one of the departments that had no examiner. The chief of the police walked up to us and he said, do you realize there is no such thing as a crime in today's world that doesn't have a cyber component? Criminals are actually taking pictures of themselves doing the deed. Right? In some cases, it's the only proof they had that they did it, and they have to prove that. It's insane. The other thing is geographic location on a cell phone. Can you do that? Well, I actually had a head of forensics at one of our police departments come up. He says, we found a Windows phone. Can, can we get geolocation off of it so that we have this individual at the scene of the crime? This is the head of forensics. Right? But that training is not there, that understanding, that practical application. They're more used to saying, let me plug this into a Cellbrite, which is one of our cellular forensics tools, push a button, and then there's the answer. Now, how long does that hold up in court? About a half second. Because if you don't understand how it works, it doesn't work out in the long run. So these things here is what we provide. This are our values. Innovation. So here's where we think we've really struck a golden nugget. How many law enforcement agencies do you know that have time to do research, R&D, discovery of new tools, new products, new capabilities for executing their job? Anybody? Yeah, zero. Right. So why not us? Why not allow students to do research? Why not allow us to have test base, test cases? And why not allow us to have capabilities where we can go out and look at some of those new technologies, bring them in, let students tear it apart and write a report on it? Sound familiar? It's a science or a research project. That report goes to the law enforcement and they go, wow, this is interesting. I think I want to do more. I think I want to look at this again. In some cases, the vendor gives us the platform to use because we're a research institution. And so I can take donations. I don't have to buy it. Now, that doesn't mean I can put it on the operational floor and use it, but I can at now at least give them the exposure that they would not get unless they bought it or went to a vendor training class. Nothing against vendor training classes. However, comma, at the end of that training session, what is the goal of the vendor? Sell a product. How many law enforcement agencies or other state agencies have money to buy at that point in time? few. Um, we're working with like with, you would think Los Angeles and Orange County have all the money in the world. They don't. So again, uh, we think we're providing something different and the students are learning and getting that connection again. They're getting the connection to what's really going on on that side of the fence so that they can be interactive and understand. Now, at this point in time, any questions? Because I'm going to go into high speed gear from here. Yes. Um, so the fun part of being a university is, is we're used to being funded by anybody who wants to write a check, give you a piece or a product, uh, or even state funds or federal funds, and we write grants like there's no tomorrow. So writing and asking for money in a grant is second nature to the university. So we've got a couple that we're doing, I'll, I'll talk about in a minute, that are grant-based. They roll your socks down. They're, they're amazing because nobody thought of it. They just didn't have time. So um, expertise. This is where we get back to your workforce. If I put a student in a learning environment where they're interacting with law enforcement or other entities within the state, how much more valuable are they as a worker when they graduate and go into the workforce? Much more. So we're also doing something that's really unique. Uh, Cisco is one, a couple others. We're actually setting up internships through the Institute so that the, the vendor basically hires the student then comes back to the university after summer and they work all the projects associated with that product. So what they're getting is a very well-trained, seasoned, knowledgeable and practical application student in that arena. So the, the value on that is just is growing magnitudes. Uh, in the National Guard side, um, they have a federal mission and a state mission. The state mission is support of the governor in the event of an attack on critical infrastructure. Anybody work in critical infrastructure or, or understand it so well that you know it's an absolute mess? 
right? And because it's a mess, what you need is you need the next generation thinking about how to solve the problem because there's no way we're going to get it done over the next five years. It's just too far. It's, it's one of those, the horse has left the barn and, oh, by the way, reproduced 35 times and now we got to get all of them back and we have no idea how to do it. All right, so th this is what we've got so far. So Cal Poly University, uh, a little background on that just to give you an idea on, on size and magnitude here. Cal Poly it has 22,000 students. So I as the CIO and, and our CISO, we have 22,000 highly, 22, highly qualified students who try to break the internet on a daily basis. So the application for us is huge. We know they're going to win. They outnumber us. So we have to figure out how to do this and be more flexible. California state law. What a lovely subject. I could go days. We have some of the most restrictive privacy laws in the world. GDPR just set us back by about four slots because it's, it's four times more restrictive than California policy. But, um, you know, we're kind of used to it. So what we've got going here is uh, several students, student interns, students, students, students. Please look at that. So these are students who are not necessarily in computer science, or in engineering. And, and I'll, I'll talk, share a little bit more about that, so I'm trying to tease you. Another one that we've done is, is we figure out that as a university working with these state agencies, you got to start a lot younger than the time they get into the university structure. So what we've done is we've worked with the governor of California's Office of Economic and Business Development, big words, uh, really, they're, they're to develop workforce, right? And the idea is we created a, what we call the Cyber Innovation Challenge. We had 16 teams from across the state of California come to the university. And what we did is we did not do Cyber Patriot. Um, do you all have Cyber Patriot here? No? All right, so Cyber Patriot is basically an, um, capture the flag for techies. And when you're done, you're really good at rules and you're following rules and diving down and figuring out who broke the rules and putting them in jail, right? It, time out. So uh, what we did with the forensics challenge was we actually said we want to change the dynamic of how this is done. So we got 16 brand new Subarus and we loaded them up with digital and physical evidence. And we put them in our large warehouse that we talked about, which is our cyber range. We built 16 workstations for the students. And basically, as the students were sitting there going through their introduction of what we were doing as an activity, the National Guard walked in and started sending off alarms and bells and whistles and driving vehicles in and, and all these other things. And they said, we have an incident. Uh, water is a big thing in California and the lack thereof. And so we said the local watershed, which is a storage for water, has been hacked. Somebody's done something to it. We've got the car, but we don't have the individual. So your job, forensics teams, is to go out, serve a warrant on the vehicle, collect the evidence, and figure out who done it. So we basically created an electronic clue for cyber forensics. Really interesting outcomes from this. Number one, students amazingly thought it was so cool. They kept saying, we're on CSI. We're on CSI. You have CSI here? Okay. We're on CSI. So that was, to them, again, what we were trying to achieve, that connectivity to that side of the fence where they saw it as cool and participatory. Number two, the students love the aspect of having to get that warrant and serving it on the vehicle. They, they made a real joke out of it, you know, dear Mr. Vehicle, here's your warrant. But then they had to collect evidence and they had to do it and they had to keep logs of the evidence they collected so that they understood the correct procedures. And again, not all this is about just supporting law enforcement. This is about following rules. It's about following the limits of where you are in cyber. Then what we did is we had physical evidence. So we had like jeans, shoes. Uh, we had an iPad, clipboards. So that's physical. On the digital side, we had passwords. We had emails, accounts. We had other accounts that were set up. And basically... If you tied A to B, you'd find out there was a digital path for finding information on the who done it. And there were tricks in that. You could either go left or right. You'd choose the wrong one or the right one. The other part that, that was then most informational for us is the students collected all that information and they had to go back to their dorms and they were to then to develop a case using critical thinking and present the case to a panel. 
So on the panel, we had members from the Department of Defense, Attorney General's Office, uh, local district attorneys, uh, CHP, law enforcement, uh, forensics officers. So we had a wide variety. Amazing presentations the next day. And the thing that was most interesting was we thought the students would go back to their room, spend a couple hours, and then they'd be done. Well, they went back to the rooms, found out we had pizza all you could eat and pop, and they ate pizza and drank pop all night long and worked on their cases. It was amazing the level of detail they put into it. Three hours into the entire competition, our lead, which is a PhD in computer science, says, I don't know if I've made it hard enough. <laughs> Remember, these are high school students. I don't know if I've made it hard enough. So it's that, just that, it's that unique opportunity to do something different in that forensics arena. And, you know, they were absolutely amazed. So they presented... Um, the team that won was from North Hollywood. Um, they were amazing. Uh, a couple of things that we found out that was really interesting as a result. Number one is, in some cases, some of the students we had, the teams, it was the first time they were on the good guy side of any action with law enforcement. So this to them was different, and they actually felt good about it. Number two, we had two all-female teams. Next year, we're supposed to have like four or five. So it'll be very interesting to see what happens. So again, what you can begin to see is at a very young age, there is talent out there if oriented and focused in the right directions. In high school. High school. So we'll be doing that same exercise again this year. Um, I'll talk about it in a minute. Uh, we've developed this training catalog. The idea here is um, to really focus around these areas of, of expertise. So what we've done is a state-based university system. We've gone out and we've made partnerships with people, both in the vendor world as a products and also in the training world to present and provide training to state agencies, National Guard and others at cost. That's pretty inexpensive compared to, um, anybody here teach at SANS? Whew, okay, I can say this, not trouble. How much does SANS cost a class? Very, very expensive. And what else do you have when you have SANS? Time commitment. So in the States, minimum $6,000 a class. The training budget for uh, law enforcement in our area, the entire law enforcement department is $16,000. How many people do you think they're sending to SANS? Right, none. So you have to find a way that it's cheaper. So part of our whole delivery mechanism, as I showed you, it's on a National Guard base. Law enforcement can stay on that base for $52 a night. Try to do that in LA or San Francisco. You can't. So you get the entire week at $52 a night and there is a dining facility, not a chow hall, they changed that word, dining facility, and that's $10 a meal. So again, it's now within their per diem rates. It's now affordable. It's now got a quality attached to it and you're interactive with kids. So we had a class that we taught and the class that we taught was law enforcement, was uh, cyber forensics for first responders. We actually had law enforcement members and we had students in the room. The students were there to be help, you know, you know hands-on kind of help. We had law enforcement officers who didn't know what a docket on the computer was to put a file into. Now that's not a knock on them because that's not their world. But the fact that I have students available to help with that teaching element and help understanding and move that, again, that information from student to senior person was an amazing thing, and it was much better received by all those involved. Now, I'm still doing a lot of talking here, so I'm expecting a question at any time. But what we've done then is, is moved around this from the training center, which is the complex itself, and it's all really around faculty, staff, and students. We've got Northrop Grumman has provided us a lab. Uh, we have a huge partnership with Amazon Web Services. Um, we have a uh, what's called the Digital Transformation Hub with Amazon Web Services. We're the only uh, U.S.-based institution to have this. Basically, what we have is the ability to do research, both cloud-based and access to cloud technologies and technologists that provide us the opportunity that we can now use that. So they actually gave us a million-dollar grant that goes to our cyber effort. So we can use technology-based research and studies for students. And so what are the things we're trying to solve in that research for, like, law enforcement? It's really simple. Digital evidence storage, video storage for law enforcement, and the proper procedures for that. And also, we're working on a project for digital forensics in the cloud. If I log in in New York, I should be able to look at the same image that you have and do digital forensics on it in California. So we're working on those things as part of, quote, the student experience. 
Uh, we're working, there are 22 other California State Universities, and then there are these things called the UCs. They're really good. Um, Cal Poly is unique uh, in that the number of students, so 22,000 students, uh, for our next year's entry class of first year students, we had 65,000 applicants for 4,200 positions. So, uh, Cal Poly. So, that gives you kind of an upper hand when it comes to student selection and other things. It also gives you an opportunity to have more uh, choice and the knowledge base. Our, our lowest GPA in the engineering school is a 4.2 for entry and their SATs are around 1300, which is uh, near you know top end. So again, it, it gives you a really unique student base for that. Law enforcement and other state partners, um, they're really where the most need is. Our state um, CISO, is asking us to establish state-based classes so that anybody who goes to work in the state, either on the IT side or the security side, will have access to these classes. So again, it, it's kind of an interesting. So let me just jump to the real fun part. Uh, we are in the midst of creating that because that's been one of the things they've asked for. Uh, what we would like to do is to talk about having both online and uh, in-residence requirements because of the, that learn by doing immersion. So in the immersion, and I'll close at that, and we can just go from there, and um, we're having all sorts of different things, but in law enforcement, we, we've found a real niche. One of the things that we're doing, uh, we opened it up last week, is we built an anechoic chamber. Uh, we bring law enforcement vehicles into the chamber, and we have uh, a PhD professor, his graduate student, and five um, undergraduate students are hacking on that law enforcement vehicle because they are um, basically an engineering nightmare because most of them are integrated without understanding cybersecurity and the integration. So many of them integrate through the main hub on the, on the car, on the vehicle, which means once you get under the dashboard, you have access to everything that's going on in the vehicle. So we're generating, building a vulnerability catalog for law enforcement to use that you can teach other law enforcement with at our center. So it's really awesome. This year's cyber challenge that we're going to do is 20 high schools from across California, and it's on medical information, health data. The health data, we have a hospital room that our liberal arts set designers built. They're building a hospital room. It even has a hospital smell in a bottle. Go figure. And then we're introducing malware into the hospital room. The students have to find all five versions of the malware, or the room goes dark. So again, um, the key here is just getting out of the box and doing something different with the resources that you have. Um, we, we've really done all this by just cooperatively working with everybody. So let me just hear with the conclusions, and, and um, I thank you for the time that you've given. There's a huge need to do something. Every one of you has a problem. It's called workforce. It's called knowledge. It, it, it's called support. If we continue, I, I, I've been in this business since it started. Yeah, I know, I don't look that old. But look, here's the problem. We are graduating more engineers to build more products. Are we really solving the problem when we do that? No, we're just selling more products. So we have to find a way to spread this across, not just the engineering, but to the rest of the university structures. We have to get the ag department involved. We have to get the engineering. We have to get liberal arts, uh, English, and others. It's going to take a community, not a bunch of techies. I'm one. I get it. But it's going to take that community to solve these problem sets. Cybercrime, cyber terrorism, the reasons why CERT are around is because we have people involved. And so, again, it's going to take that community response. Our opportunity, we don't think, is that unique in that we took advantage of all the things that we had. Fiber hub, capabilities, vendors. I, you know, I'm two hours out of San Jose. There's a few vendors in that neck of the woods. So again, it's all about access and who you have. And lastly, um, you know, um, you got to replicate these things. You got to have ways to share this information. So like the regional forensics lab we built, they're redesigning building elsewhere in the state. What's interesting about that lab, we, the university, run it and support it, but we don't do any of the evidence or anything else. We let the law enforcement community do that. But we're the support agency for that. With that, I see people coming in. Um, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. And if you have any questions, I'll be available outside. Thank you. Thanks so much, Bill. Bill's a good friend of the University of Queensland. So if you can give him another round of applause, thank you very much.